Hello, everybody. Welcome to Raising Multilinguals Live. My name is Tetsu Young, and a very, very early, early morning here. It's about 5 a.m. in the Montreal area. Hello, Ute. How are you doing? I'm doing fine here. It's 11 o'clock in uh, Central Europe. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, getting up so early this morning, Tetsu. Hello, my name is Uteli Macharibo from Ute's International Lounge. And uh, today we have the pleasure to have Dr. Rais Calafato as our guest at Rising Multilinguals Live. Now, let me briefly introduce the topic of today. So multilingual families are often transnational multilingual families. They use diverse languages and navigate multiple cultural, ethnic, linguistic, and national identities. And here I quote our guest in, uh, from one of his uh, latest articles. He is professor, associate professor at the University of Southeastern Norway. He has a background in teaching English and French in multiple countries, as well as international research experience that draws from government, think tank, and polling company related work. His research interests include language learning motivation, learner and teacher self-regulation a lot, <laughs> multilingual learner, language learner and teacher mindsets, teacher identity, teacher education, the implementation of multilingual pedagogies by foreign language teachers, the promotion of multimodal competence and literacy among learners, literature and language education, and family language policy and emotions in transnational multilingual families. And today we will focus on the interplay between multilingualism, identity and language planning in transnational multilingual families. In other words, how these families perceive their multilingualism as identity and how this identity affects their language planning. Thank you very, very much, uh, Raiz, for joining us today. My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. But before we dive into the topic, which is multilingual identity and language policy in transnational multilingual families, please tell us first about yourself and also your involvement in the world of language and in particular language learning and language use within transnational multilingual families. And who are these families? Thank yeah, thank you. So thank you so much for having me, first of all, and it's, it's great to see you both. Uh, in terms of myself, it's a. I could probably go on for a really long time talking about that. It's a, one could start by saying perhaps that I come from a pretty mixed background. Uh, when it comes to my family, my dad's side is, your father is, uh, let's say Italian American. Well, originally from Sicily, from the you know his grandfather immigrated to the United States. Uh, so Sicilian American. Mom's side of the family. Mom is a Pakistani. Turkish citizen, she has, you know, and we have family in, in India. Um, we have, I've grown up in several different cities because both my parents were, and well, they were another, I think they're, well, they were uh, teacher teachers uh, into, into education. So we traveled quite a lot. We moved every, every so many years, perhaps three to four years, we moved to different countries, different cities because of their jobs. And so we grew up around, several languages several different uh dialects in the same country for example or you know you can call them minority languages or regional languages uh and in terms of my background i could say that sicilian italian is more like a heritage language because whenever you know there are we have we have relatives in for, in, in italy but we also have relatives in france again the the our families are quite all over the place in a little bit in, in a way like they, they they travel they've moved uh but but personally myself it's i have italian as a as a heritage language so i can i can speak it i can understand it i can read it it's not it's not fluent i don't use it as often but it's there uh obviously urdu is a would be a first language uh english is also a first language is something that we constantly used at home um uh, turkish I'm also fluent in Turkish. I speak fluent Russian. So in terms of my language background, it is quite it is quite all over the place. And then having lived in different countries, for example, in the Middle East, I also speak Arabic and so on and so forth. So I, I don't want to get in too much into details about that. But in terms of a language background, it's quite I have several first languages and, and, and a multitude of second languages or those that I acquired after my first languages, let's say. Uh, 
And when it comes to research on multilingualism and multilingual families, it's something that's very close to personally. It's something that uh, I would describe my family as a, as a very multilingual family. And also we can call it, you know, different ethnicities or different ways of thinking and cultures involved over there, different countries involved. So it's quite transnational. And it's something that I've been very interested in researching because the, you know, the, uh, the number of such families has increased quite a bit. Uh, over the years due to globalization and uh, and that's something that's that's very very important for me to research uh, as as Uta kind of introduced I've been teaching I've taught English in several countries I've also taught French um, I've worked for government for a government think tank but I also looked at education as part of other things uh, I teach I mean I'm an associate professor of English at USN in Norway Again, so it's dealing with language and it's teacher education and it's teach it's training teachers, language teachers in a way is, is a part of that. And uh, I've also done that as part of my, let's say, education. So uh, masters, my PhD, all focus on language education, the use of languages and the place of language in society with the focus on on education. So, yeah, I think, yeah. Has it been like that from the beginning as in, you know, you're... you're language heritage and the background is you know, very clear everybody can see that but in between you said you went to think tank and uh, uh, before becoming involved in the academic sphere in that middle part was was it all related to languages and and, and culture or is this where was there something completely separate so even when when you are when you do speak several languages one of the best ways to uh, to go for in terms of a career, it's it would be ideal to be able to use those languages. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, the employment opportunities that open up to you as a as a because of being multilingual are much more. I would say you have more opportunities. So the the work that I did at the think tank, or whether it was like uh, was teaching, was very tightly linked to how many languages I spoke. So for, for wow. if it was. Yeah, so I I use those languages as part of my work in terms of interacting with other people, with, with employees, you know, with colleagues at my workplace, but also in terms of my work. So whether it was uh, looking for sources or writing reports, it was very very important to be able to speak in multiple languages because I was also working in very multilingual, multicultural environments uh, where several languages were spoken. So in these kind of very super diverse environments, one can of course survive and and be fine with just one language, but speaking many languages opens up many different doors. Uh, it has a very, so yeah, I think it was, I've always used languages, whether it's at, whether it's academically in, in academia, but also outside. So whether, whether it was teaching or working for polling companies, um, or whether it was, for example, working for that think tank. It was it was always several languages, and I think we'll get into this a little bit later about what kind of doors that opens for you, and how people perceive you, and how you perceive people. It's a it's a very different experience. Fantastic, fantastic. Absolutely, yes. It's it's a little bit how we we found each other, uh, all three of us. I think online that uh, we we think in the same way, and we live in all these languages, and that is our normal. So, I'm very happy that we can focus on this today. <laughs> so. Um, but let's get back to the to the topic of today, and we are talking about uh, transnational multilingual families and how can uh, or are transnational multilingual families using their languages? And you you did several studies about this. Maybe you want to tell us a little bit more about that. So how they use it? I don't know between the parents. You mentioned yourself that your parents also are transnational, um, and then the parents and the children, and the children among them, and then the family or every family member with the community, et cetera. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And perhaps before before oh. we jump in, uh, is is definition maybe something that we want to make sure that it's uh, all our viewers can can understand what transnational families would actually mean uh, if it's specifically different uh, to other terms that we use? Yeah, absolutely. So transnational is used when you think about multilingualism, even everybody can sort of think about multilingualism in different ways. For some people in, in China, if you look at the official policy documents, they focus on being multilingual means being 
proficient in foreign languages. So that could be one way of looking at multilingualism. Another could be that you are multilingual by birth, which means you have two or more first languages. Some people, many researchers also don't agree on where multilingualism begins. They make a distinction between bilingualism and multilingualism, but then you can also talk about being bilingual, trilingual, um, and so on and so forth. So my approach to defining multilingualism is, is using more than one language. Uh, as part of daily interactions, knowledge of more than one uh, of more of more than one language, and language over here is defined as as any language. So it could be a standard official, uh, st an official variety. It could also be like dialects, etc. Um, and this is because I'm looking at families and at multilingual families, and not at the education context specifically over here. So that I define multilingualism and languages in that way. And when it comes to transnational. Again, you have different definitions of transnational. Some people will define it as, so you've got the parents are separated. One is living back home and, then, and, then, and the other one is living in another country or relatives that are divided between different countries. And that's transnational. For me, transnational is that you have a, a couple. So it could be, you know, a father or mother or however you see that. But you have, you have a parents, relatives who cross national boundaries they might be living together but might they might be from different but they are from different countries so you can in a way they're multinational not necessarily multi-ethnic because that's a little bit different uh, you could be from the same ethnicity but you can have different nationalities or dis or different citizenship uh, in this day and age so these are these are people who are a family unit that crosses national borders uh, and so this is how i do so when you talk about a transnational multilingual family it's a family that crosses national borders and is and uses multiple languages in their daily interactions uh, and so that's how i would and where and specifically the the families that i looked at where you had each of the parents using multiple languages so often you will see studies or you will see families where uh, multiple languages are spoken maybe by one member but not all members like not all members are necessarily uh, you know, they they don't all use multiple languages. So, so there are different degrees of multilingualism. There are different degrees of transnationalism, and they're all relevant, mm -hmm. and they're all very, very interesting. But the ones that I looked at specifically was this definition that, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, and um, I think we should ask about, like, what kind of... Yes. <laughs> what are they doing exactly? Yes. So it's it's really you... It's it's very interesting because you meet with you you're meeting with most of the studies that you much of the research is qualitative. It's focusing on a specific you know small number of families because again there's so much there's so much diversity variation and there's so much complexity. It it, it that it is it is only like logical to engage with a couple of families or a few families at, at at the same time, and you can see a huge variation in how families use their languages and it's again it's informed by their ideologies it's formed by how they see their identity where they see they're coming from uh, which is again why i focus on this idea of this multilingual identity so at least in the studies that i have done you see uh, a great deal of what we call translanguaging so it's like switching and and fluidly moving or crossing language boundaries in a way so you it's like you use multiple languages within sentence or in every other sentence like there it, it's different how they how they use it but what i saw among the families that at least that i took took a look at was that there was generally this use of multiple languages when parents were speaking with each other but also with their children uh for the for the most part so yeah uh this is not always the case i mean as you know uh, you have also this one parent, one language policy where one where parents will stick to a particular first language. This often happens in perhaps families where the parent only knows or has one first language. So if you again, if you have a parent who has multiple first languages, that kind of doesn't really apply over there. But uh, yeah, a lot of variation. So each parent just chooses just speaks one language with their child. They might speak multiple languages with each other. Uh, or they might, I mean, they might pick another language to speak with their child. Uh, this could be English, for example, to get the child's level up in there. So it's really, you have a very, you have huge variation in how parents decide to speak with their 
each, with each other and also with their children based on yeah. their ideologies. Yeah, from from questions that I get from parents, uh, some, sometimes they get quite overwhelmed themselves. They speak different languages, but they don't know how to transmit it to their kids. I, I just like literally got another question on my YouTube channel uh, where mom uh, speaks a certain set of languages, dad speaks a certain set of languages, but they speak English, which is not their, which is not a, uh, their, their first language. And then they they live in an Arabic country. So the kid learns Arabic at school, which neither parent speaks. And then she's like, with all this, I don't know how to trans, you know, transmit all my languages to, to the kids, uh, et cetera. And, and I sort of, uh, you know, my thoughts on that were, I, I first told her, first of all, you want to know which ones do you want to transmit to your, your kids? First of all, it's not because you speak, you know, three, four, five, six languages that you necessarily want to transmit all of them, uh, or you have to know which ones. And then, and then from there you could set up your strategy. So, so indeed, I uh, guess, you know, part of the question that we have for you is well, whether there's a right or wrong way for trans, uh, transnational or multilingual families uh, to use their languages. But, uh, you know, it, it's almost like a rhetorical question. It's like, you know, with so much diversity, there's just, everybody has their custom, custom yeah. made way to, to, to do things, I, I presume. There are, there are certainly a couple of things that one can keep in mind. So that one thing that uh, is important to understand is that language is a lot more than just a tool. I mean, it has that in instrumental value where you're, you, know, you speak a language, but there are also other effects that language that brings to the table when it comes to, you know, ways of looking at the world, ways of perceiving the world, ways of perceiving others. And, and, and there's, there's a very, very strong social aspect, of course, to language. When it comes to like right or wrong ways, uh, it's hard to talk about right or wrong ways. It's it's what is uh, what are the parents trying to accomplish? Yeah, what what, what yeah. is the goal really? Uh, is it to uh, you know often in 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 multi like in family language policy studies you'll see uh, you have like immigrants. Let's say they're going uh, often from mono ethnic. So let's say uh, you know a, a Korean family or uh, a Syrian family or uh, an Arabic. Or an Arab family, they're, they've immigrated to Europe and they're trying to protect their, uh, they're trying to pass on Arabic to their kids who are now learning another language, who are being socialized into many, many different things uh, through another language that perhaps the parents don't speak. So then you have this kind of a, a defense mechanism in a way to protect culture and language by passing. So if, if that's the goal of the families is to pass on that kind of knowledge, then of course they will be using a separate a set of strategies where they'll probably stress that speak Arabic at home. You know, we only speak Arabic at home. You can speak the other language outside, but at home you only speak Arabic. There'll be a stress on basically the parents will be perhaps will try to find some kind of a school or or a, a, perhaps over the weekends where they're sending their children for Arabic lessons, etc. So they will that that will be their strategy if they're very if they're if, a, if they have a certain identity that's very very strong. If if they're more fluid in their identity as multilinguals where they don't really have a very strong uh, they don't have one or another very identity that's very very strong uh, they might be much more flexible in how they approach they might just be like as long as he's multilingual or as long as my kid is multilingual then they will adapt uh, to that situation they might promote you know other things as long as the child or they themselves are picking up multiple languages that just that satisfies their I guess their multi their identity as being multilingual. It doesn't necessarily, you know, it, they they don't require that their language practice practices satisfy a particular ethnic or national identity. Then they will of course uh, employ other tools over there. So it's not really there's no right and wrong. It's just what uh, what is being what do you want to accomplish as parents like do you just want them to be multilingual do you want them to be a certain type of multilingual you want them to speak a certain number of languages so you want them to speak specific languages and how do you want them to i mean there are also other perhaps other things that that maybe parents don't consider is about just raising their awareness or perhaps giving them giving your children the tools to learn languages much more effectively so raising their awareness about i don't know morpho syntax or 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 giving them tips about how they can learn or like, you know, learning strategies rather than teaching them specific languages, 
giving them the tools that they can actually do that independently on their own, like mm -hmm. how they're sort of supposed to do at school. So there are many different strategies that people can can employ, but the most important thing is that what are they hoping to accomplish? Yes. Yeah. And, and I think also what can they accomplish with uh, their children, because there is also the children's agency, the, the, the attitude yeah. of the children plays a, a very fundamental role in many families, right? Mm -hmm. So what parents have in their mind and with what idea they start might uh, transform, might change throughout the years, uh, depending on so many different factors. And you, you talk about this in your studies and, and others, other experts as well. So, um, but you mentioned one thing about identity and I would like to, go over to the next question uh when using multiple languages on a daily or regular basis what effect does this have on our identity formation before you said uh whether the children or whether the parents uh want the children to have a strong identity or they are more um, fluent or, or, or fluidity i think you you yeah, use that fluid. word um so what i would like to emphasize here is one can have also a very strong multilingual identity, right? Mm -hmm. So being very strong in defending to have the right to use all of my languages. So can you maybe explain a little bit more about this? If we, if we want to define identity, there are again a number of ways of doing it, but in a simple way, it could be defined as how we perceive and are perceived by others. Uh, how we perceive ourselves and how also others perceive us is kind of like an interaction with the environment. So, and there are and there are many different types of identity. You can have a you can talk about a personal identity is is how you really see yourself in its entirety and it's in, in, in the full complexity of who you are. But there's also like a social identity is how you behave outside with other people, which might not really match how you feel inside, right? So you might have. Um, if you're multilingual in a very monolingual environment, you might feel the need to hide that multilingualism in mm. order to fit in. This happens all, all a lot oh, of all yeah. the time, right? It's like you want to fit in. This need to fit in um, means that you can't really be yourself in public. Um, and then, of course, you have ethnic identity and other things. When it comes to uh, how learning languages affects your identity formation, especially among young kids, I mean, children, but also adults and anybody really, is that. Uh, language learning is not something that happens in isolation. Yes, of course, you can like open up Duolingo and like go through a couple of sentences here and there. But most often, language learning also happens with in interactions with other people. Those are experiences over there. There are you know feelings and emotions. None, none of that can be really separated from language. It, you're you are inevitably going to be introduced to other ways of seeing things. You're going to be introduced to other concepts. Could be some you know it could be something as deep as morality, but also. Uh, politics, society, history, everything, uh, expressions, ways of describing color, ways of uh, descri ways of describing, you know, movement and actions and time. Uh, all of that is going to affect how you see the world and how you see people. Uh, it is an, it is it's quite inevitable, really. It, it's going to have some kind of an effect. So, when you talk about having a multilingual identity. Um, the effects on a person in terms of their psychology, emotions. Uh, can be quite comprehensive. Uh, and so what can happen is that, and I, and I talk a little bit about this in my studies, is that this multilingual identity is something that, it would be harder, to, I mean, it's where you nece don't necessarily feel like you belong to any one particular place or nation it's a it's it could be seen as a negative thing and also a positive thing where you feel like you are unique uh, and so what you can also see is that a lot of perhaps multilinguals will hang out with other multilinguals because they feel like um but again it doesn't necessarily necessarily have to be like a specific language combination but multilinguals tend to un feel more comfortable with other multilinguals it could be because they can they understand that there are certain you know there are certain behaviors like translanguaging, et cetera, that is that's very um, a very multilingual thing to do that monolinguals cannot understand or would or would perhaps look very negatively on. Is that what's what's going on? It sounds like it's it's ugly or you're mixing stuff, you should keep them separate, you should just speak one or the other, why are you mixing them, et cetera? Um, so yeah, and I mean and that also is what makes it so interesting is that you have the number of such families uh growing as you have globalization you have like this mobility 
you have more such families developing and in terms of research and what governments need to do and what educate like how do, how do schools deal with multilingual children like they, it's it's really something that a lot of teachers and schools can struggle with because they don't have the tools they don't it's get it's, it's gotten much much better than it was in the past of course but it's still you know in a lot of places it's still hard to it's still challenging um, yeah. but it it needs to be recognized is that while we are promoting you know, foreign language education in schools, we're promoting this multilingualism, you have this stress on it. it needs to be understood that the effects that this will have on younger generations will not just be restricted to language use, it will be, it will affect much, much more than that. Yes. Um, and so that's, that needs to be taken into account um, at multiple levels, yes. and, and accommodated in a way, uh, because otherwise you will have, you know, you will have you might have problems uh, when it comes to like, you know, trying to fit in uh, this sense of in-betweenness or not belonging. And how do you, how can you display, like how can you bring your real identity out and not have to hide it in public? Like how, how do people interact in public? How are services accessed, et cetera? How, you know, how, how are, how is content taught in schools in terms of assessment? It, it kind of touches everything. Uh, so it, it's, it's quite important. Yes, we we had uh, someone also here on Raising Multilinguals Live talking about the, the language friendly schools. It was uh, Ellen Rose Campbell talking mm -hmm. about that, that is uh, now having more and more schools worldwide and also one Chinese school. I, I'm saying this because uh, in your studies, you, you mentioned this um, a Belt and Road Initiative in, in China yeah. uh, that can maybe, please correct me if I'm wrong, can be compared to the Mother Tongue Plus Two Initiative here in Europe and that we can observe in many, many other countries as well or, or yeah, <laughs> continents, so to say. Uh, that promotes the the knowledge of further languages, whatever these languages are, whether they are now English and French, etc., or uh, other local languages or dialects even. So I think uh, that that goes a little bit in the same direction, in the same tendency of embracing more and more this diversity uh, language-wise, but not only with uh, regards to the language, but also with the culture in the end, right? Right. So the Belt and Road Initiative is more is was is primary is primarily it has multiple components. Uh, it is a it is something that you can also see as an economic or financial commercial. It's like commerce, establishing commerce across multiple countries. But it certainly has a very very strong multilingual and multicultural component because commerce and and relationships between countries cannot really be advanced unless one understands the other. And the way to understand other cultures and other people is is through language really uh, primarily but then of course there are those other components about culture and identity so implicitly there is an understanding that and the government in china has invested and is investing uh is, in, is investing resources in, in promoting this focus on other languages multiple languages getting people more multilingual so that again they can establish relations you know good relationships with other countries or along the belt and road which covers countries pretty much all over uh, and again, it's when you're doing that, it's, I think it's also for, for, for governments. I'm not sure that they do realize that the, the effects that that can have on, on the population. Again, it goes beyond language, right? So like if you're promoting the, the study of, of French and Ch uh, French and Japanese and, you know, Korean and German in China, yes, students will pick that up they will learn and perhaps become proficient in those languages but it will not just be limited to the languages it, they will they will their identity will be affected to some extent uh, their their ways of seeing the world will be affected their their knowledge base will it will expand their awareness their multicultural awareness all of that will expand so they will not be the same as chinese citizens who only speak chinese they will not have that same identity and outlook on life like they will be different uh, and so mm -hmm. that's something that this these studies on, on on multilingual families transnational families kind of show is that in in in, in these instances you basically have children who don't necessarily you you don't have people who necessarily identify as one or another nationality anymore they are something entirely different so mm -hmm. uh, some of my ongoing studies they might prefer to use the the term global citizen which means we're not we're no longer chinese or or this or that we're just global citizens we are you know 
we don't see ourselves as uh, being part of any one group. We are like our own group or we're unique. And that also then is witnessed in their language practices where they'll go and use one language in, in one country and another language in another. So like if they speak Chinese and and French, they'll use French in China and Chinese in France instead of the other way around, like in order not to fit in, but to be like, we're different. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, these kind of practices and where something else we, we don't, you know, we don't necessarily relate to others in the same way. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and, and that reminds me very much of the third culture kids. This this uh, yeah kind of definition, of, although we are moving away from that uh, a little bit, but where uh, families in global transition is also a little bit a tribe of people who, like you, uh, grew up in different countries and with different languages, and you, you bring it with you. So you, it's not, you're not neither nor, but you're not only, but also. So it's something that I, I like to say yeah. very often. But um, I, I would like to come back to, to the use of multiple languages. And, and so the, the use of multiple languages is very dynamic, like you just uh, said now, and I think you almost uh, replied to this next question. So because these language shifts, the importance of what language that when we were younger um, can become different when we grow up because we move countries, we, we work in a different uh, environment, etc., or study. And all kinds of changes can have an impact on our language use. We know that. And can you maybe share more about what you observed with the people that you interviewed about this, this uh, dynamic aspect of being multilingual? Yeah, so I saw some... I saw some very interesting uh, things for in, in the study that was published. For example, there was this couple, a Turkish uh, Turkish Chinese couple, and he'd been living he'd been living in China for at the time of the study it was over a decade, and he'd become the, the shift that happened was that his again uh, it was his Turkish kind of went away a little bit. He stopped using Turkish and he. He went. He went almost completely over Chinese. So in his, he, he basically. So that could be one example of how you're you're still multilingual, but it is very dynamic. It depends on your pref. It de depends on people's preferences. There's no like hard and, fa and, and, and fast rule that you know, I will always be very very multilingual. The more I travel, the more multilingual I get. Again, it depends on on multiple factors. It depends on your job. It depends on how are you. What what you know the languages that you use in all these different domains it, it depends on a lot of different factors so language shift can happen for a number of reasons you also see very often uh, this happen with you know you have a family immigrates to another country and they completely adopt another identity so like they complete they you know members can make a conscious decision to no longer speak their first languages or they completely forget it after a time they just adopt. For, mm -hmm. for for their own reasons, maybe they're embarrassed about it or about their origin, or they don't like it for some reason. They might have some you know ideas about. Uh, so this is language shift happens because it is it is ultimately a conscious decision to move away. I don't, I I I very much doubt that it happens unconsciously. At least in the, in the families that I surveyed, they were conscious decisions to move away from certain languages and adopt others. Yeah. Um, and then again, it depends on uh, it depends on on you know how how languages are ultimately used, how the person themselves. It's it, this is other study that I'm doing where again certain negative situations might lead to more interesting dynamics. So let's say that you're. You know, you have a multilingual family. They're very happy about their languages. They're very happy about the fact that they speak several languages. They want to pass this on to their child. Their child, however, uh, just wants to stick to one, has no desire to be multilingual like them, right? So this can be a source of anxiety and negative emotions for the parents because they're seeing their child. You know, let's say that you're very we're polyglots. I speak five languages. Wife speaks five languages, for example. Very, very happy about the fact that we can travel to any country and and be at ease and we can move very fluidly from one country to the other but our you know our child is just basically fixated on english and that is the mm -hmm. only language that they want to speak and they don't see any need to speak any other language for example like we talked about agency right so yes. how do these negative that's you see you know that can lead to conflict and anxiety in the family and you can have perhaps then 
parents doing like weird stuff for example they will ban all tv shows unless they're in a specific languages or they'll be like we can you can watch anything except in english like they will they will start try implementing these strategies to try to get the child to speak other languages so it can be very uh, we see this often with heritage languages like heritage languages mm -hmm. you know family moves to the to the us the 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 parents speak to the child in one language and they respond in another and they refuse to and that can also be so this is like a an evolution of that so uh yeah it's so languages language use is constantly evolving our knowledge and awareness uh, you know our vocab and other things are constantly evolving if you are if we're talking about multilingualism again it is evolving to a to an un, in, in very very dynamic ways that don't always come out in public because people generally tend to hide who they really are yeah. right so how they how they are in at home with each other versus how they behave in public so it's, it's sometimes very hard to understand those dynamics because um yeah and, and do you find it difficult to sort of extract this information from these families since you say people are not what they say they are or what what they don't say what they are and sometimes you need to ask the right questions to really like extract what what they what they really think uh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it depends on their level of comfort with you. Again, it also, you know, this yes. is this one of one of the things is that you have a lot of inter you have interviews and a lot of research done where the researchers can be monolingual, or th there are also those mm -hmm. dynamics between researcher and the and those who are researched or the participants, right? It's like, what language are you speaking to them in? Is it only one language? Is it multiple languages? Uh, that can have a huge effect on on the kind of trust that you establish. Uh, the other thing is that certain things with interviews, yeah, you have to ask them in a certain way. But I've also tried to re rely on video, on video like recordings, uh, stuff that not not stuff that they can make especially for the study, which can be a little strange, right? Because they might try to behave in a certain way to satisfy mm -hmm. the researcher. Mm -hmm. But things that they've already recorded over the past to study them in terms of emotions, languages used, etc., to get an idea of how they behave with each other, uh, which is also again. It's, it's difficult because they might not share everything with you or they might only share select things with you but that's just that's just the the, the you know nature of research but it is very difficult it is it is not easy it is not easy to get into into touch with to get in touch with these types of families to earn their trust where they can open up to you because again there are certain dynamics over there let's say if i'm um in norway if i'm let's say a mono like a norwegian you know i'm a, I'm a norwegian speaker first language norwegian speaker and you're talking to uh, immigrants from another country there there might be certain power there might be a difference in power dynamics over mm -hmm. there they might mm -hmm. not be comfortable discussing things uh depending on how they perceive me right so uh, these things have to be kept in mind and of course the use of languages itself has a very uh strong effect so if i'm going to speak to this family in norwegian which is not their first language their behavior will be different than when I speak to them in a bunch of, you know, in in one of their first languages or a mix of other first languages, right? It'll be it'll be very very different uh, kind of emotions that they will have, that they will express, and the, and the kind of information and details that they will offer. So that's going to be very very different, and and that's been proven in studies, like where where that's that has been, you know, shown that depending on the language you use and how you use it, you will get uh, you know di different info very different yes. reactions. Yes, so... I think uh, we, we had um, uh, Jean-Marc de Valle talking about this a few episodes ago. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, in your studies, and this is the next question, in your studies you mentioned the commodification. We were talking about it uh, slightly now as well, of uh, multilingualism. Can you maybe explain what commodification is, and especially with regards to families, to multilingual families, right? Yeah. Yeah, who, who use multiple languages right i mean this thing is in the past it was like something that you had an elite among the elite right so yeah. it was quite often for them to be like um well read in latin and, and and greek ancient greek this was like a mark of oh they speak french and greek and latin it's like this person is from a good background a high background mm -hmm. prestigious etc and so that really hasn't gone away that that sort of continues even now commodification of multilingualism is especially with with children but also with, with individuals is that there is a certain prestige to to knowing mm -hmm. certain languages and, and being multilingual and many parents invest large sums of money to ensure that their children get a head start 
so this is something that I saw in China as well, but also in some of the other countries that I'm looking at is that children, is that parents with the means, the financial means to do it, will be investing pretty early on in their child's education in multiple languages. So I've seen we have a trilingual uh, kindergartens and nurseries where these are advertised to the elite. It's not something that normal people can afford. It's something that I saw also when I was like working in when I was in Russia. Let's say this was three years ago. And you had these really elite multilingual, trilingual kindergartens where, or, or even more. So you have English, Russian, Chinese, uh, and French being taught from even preschool. And they're, and they're advertised as this trilingual thing. And and they're busy. They're, they're full of kids. You have, you know, parents are, are queuing up to put their kids in these kinds of schools. Again, it's to get a head start. They feel that the child will be it's it's a marketable commodity so they will get a head start they will be this in terms of their career and who they are uh, they will be able to get you know access to to employment but they will also be seen differently as some kind of like an elite uh thing that that is you know different from so in terms of commodification it is this thing that it becomes a product a marketable product so you know child is multilingual a person is multilingual it could be uh getting something as easy as a job but also interest, you're, and you're and you're ultimately perceived as being perhaps smarter. Uh, you could be seen as it, again. It depends on what languages you know. Again, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. it's it, somebody who speaks, you know, in many places, somebody who speaks English, French, and German uh, might be more highly valued than someone who speaks Somali, uh, Amharic, and I don't know something like there, there are. You know, the, you, you can talk about the linguist. The, the marketplace is a bit different. <laughs> Uh, but there is a certain commodification of multilingualism, and and like in the study I talked about, it's like there is there are large sums of money being spent on tutors. So it's like you know my child needs to know English and Chinese and Arabic or French, etc. So you have not just one language but multiple languages being invested in uh, to ensure that the child is suitably multilingual, not as a, just as a way for in terms of instrumental or and again I talked about how parents don't realize how that affects the child beyond just using language as a tool, but it's it's not just instrumental, but also as a way to showcase that, oh, my kid speaks these languages or we speak these languages. It's kind of like a badge of like, yeah, like a, like a badge that you kind of showcase to everybody. It's like, this is our level of prestige in a way. It's, it's uh, a very nice term. I, I've ne never really thought of this uh, this way, but yeah, commodification of languages. I mean, everybody uh, seeing somebody who speaks different languages but whereas earlier it's like wow this guy speaks different languages it's it's almost like wow it's it's like a uh somebody who's in a circus maybe kind of like like it's it's cool but you know it's it's it is what it is but today it's more like yeah it's it's something that's a legitimate uh skill that can be learned that can be uh uh, I, I guess acquired from a, you know from an academic kind of mindset, something that you can go to school to 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 get uh, something that's worth investing in. As you mm -hmm. say, uh, many of these Asian countries uh, now really think that it's important to to have their kids to speak English uh, and or other languages and uh, and vice versa. May I, I get many you know, Western parents asking me about how to how to get their kids to to speak Chinese. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a hot yeah. language that every, oh, yeah. you know, many people want to have Absolutely. their kids learn <laughs> without them having any connection to China. Just just the fact that, you know, the economic prospects uh, and career prospects uh, are increased by, by speaking Chinese. So, so yeah. Absolutely. And, and, you know, and in some ways, you know, beyond being like a, curiosity or a novelty is like oh like you said you know it's like somebody speaks multiple languages is like an interesting it's perhaps just like something new and interesting but not necessarily needed it is it is really shifted now in terms of everybody racing to ensure that their children learn languages as early as they can and learn as many as they can etc and there has in the past while being monolingual was seen as like this idea of purity mm. and being really great and amazing at one language to and multilingualism being like a sign of perhaps confusion and 
you know, even retardation, some people thought that because you have a limited number of resources, like you have, your brain is a limited resource. And instead of, you know, allocating all your resources to learning one language perfectly, you're kind of dividing it among several languages. And so you can't really be good at any language. Most of that has been in some ways debunked. And what mm -hmm. you have now is the opposite happening where multilinguals are seen as desirable in, in many ways, depending on, of course, what languages you speak. But being monolingual is seen as something that is actually quite bad and a sign and, an, and possibly a sign of, of low intelligence, even in some ways. Like when you have someone mm -hmm. speaking like, oh, I only speak English or I only speak Norwegian, that's no longer seen as a very positive statement or, and not something that will at least invite like compliments or praise. Like, oh, that's great. You only speak English. That's like super, <laughs> you know, like nobody says that before or sees that as a positive thing. It's like, oh, you poor, poor you, like, you know, poor you, perhaps like yeah. it, it's seen as negative, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. it, it's seen quite so, negatively now. So, so, so. Oh. I was gonna say so, so. Some of these things that you touched upon earlier, uh, like like kids who, uh, like in Japan, we hear this often. Like kids would go live in the states or some somewhere for for a few years for parents' work, and they go back to Japan, and then they go into a, a completely yeah you know, monolingual environment, and uh, they have their English lessons, and now they're they're actually speaking English with an accent on purpose so that they fit in. Uh, they don't want others uh, teasing them. Uh, hopefully, you know, with this uh, with with this different viewpoint on multilingualism, uh, giving it more emphasis and more parents look, you know, looking positively upon multilingualism, uh, the whole society looking more positively upon uh, multilingualism. Hopefully, that these kind of negative impacts will uh, will diminish. Yes, but what I find very very interesting, and also in in your studies, you focus not on on the, the classical kind of families and environments like in Europe and in Northern uh, America, uh, the United States, but you focus on groups, on families, on situations that are not described that much yet, but more and more, and I'm very happy that they are, mm -hmm. because they are opening up different perspectives on how to perceive, how to live, and how to support multilingualism across the globe, I might say. So I, I just uh, had the opportunity to talk with someone who is active about that in, uh, in Africa, in different African countries. And it's highly interesting and highly uh, demand on, on fostering this healthy uh, kind of view on multilingualism, considering it as something that is dynamic, that is hybrid, that it's not an exclusion or something that one needs to be ashamed of. And, and Tetsu just mentioned this, this accent, right? If you, if you come back and you want to fit in, this, this um, need to fit in and to be part of a group that is also dictated by the society that we come back to or that we move on to. So I can imagine these children, when they are in the US, they, they try to sound like their peers. And when they're in Japan, they want to sound like their Japanese peers who have maybe another accent. Or if you're in France, the same thing, in Italy, the same thing, etc. cetera. Uh, depending then also on the language that we're talking about. Now we were talking about English. What about another language that is not very prestigiously accepted or recognized throughout the world so that is another topic i think but we could go on and on with with uh, talking about this i guess but i really appreciate this this new not new perspective but very needed perspective on other kind of settings and uh, cultures on multilingualism would you like to say something about that that you uh, what made you study these other kind of cultures instead of uh, the mainstream ones i think it's very obvious yeah i mean one of the things is that they haven't really been researched like there, there's absolutely very there's little known about what's happening in these in these different countries and the other thing is that these countries are also now for example china is witnessing a lot so you know china has the largest number of foreign language learners both inside and outside the country it's like they send millions of students uh, to other countries to learn so again you ha you have this this, and a lot of them, of course, marry, like, you know, some people can marry, they have partners in other countries, etc. So like, there's a, there's a huge, there is some, there are some very interesting changes taking place in China following the opening up. Uh, and not all of these changes have really been studied uh, as much. So for me, I think I was taking a look at countries, you know, where that are witnessing a rising number of 
transnational multilingual families, but where little is known about, you know, how do their language ideologies and other things interact with their behavior? What are they doing? How, do they have a multilingual identity? Do they, you know, do they have this, do they still hang on to a Chinese identity? Like how is their identity being affected by this? Is it different from other places? And I wanted to take a look at, at families that are not necessarily immigrant families. Like you have a lot of research on immigrants, like who are, you know, they've, especially in the European and American context is like they've come from Mexico or they're coming from, you know, uh, could be Afghanistan or Syria, et cetera. So like there's, that's a certain type of multilingualism and a certain type of family. But I was also look, taking a look at um, those that have been there for a long time that have, you know, been an established. Uh, I wanted to move away from, um, from, a, from a very specific immigrant focus to something that's like, a little bit different as well at the same time because we have a lot of studies on on immigrant populations i think that's also very very valuable but i also wanted to take a look at well how are more established families doing in terms of their multilingualism um, and what and how is that being affected so there were a number mm -hmm. of reasons for taking a look at china but also at the specific families that i focused on mm -hmm. yeah. and then there are also the very mobile families like yours and and ours or or others on the, in the group, etc. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I, I would like to close maybe uh, with a question that we often ask our, our guests. That's very general. What tips would you give to transnational multilingual families? Something that uh, would practically sum up what you would suggest them to focus on or how to make it I wouldn't say easier, nothing is really easy when it's really worth doing. <laughs> I just said it to my children who are in the middle of an exam. So, but um, it's actually what I would like to know is what you would suggest in order to make it healthier, dynamic, enticing, <laughs> and, and so that the children and the family keeps on yeah, fostering all their languages, so to say. Yeah. Uh one thing that i would strongly stress is that teaching or investing in in learners you know in, in your children and also in yourselves in terms of learning languages is great but also think about how you can teach them strategies from an early age like tools to learn languages quicker uh, so that's something that perhaps parents don't do too much of so it's more like sending kids to lessons or speaking languages with you know more in terms of doing it more naturally and hoping that they will passively acquire all this knowledge, which, which they do. But it's also good to focus on raising their language awareness in general. So I think that's those are strategies that can be done from an early age that are not really done from an early age is to focus on how can we learn languages? What are the different building blocks? What can we focus on increasing that awareness from, a, from an early age would actually reap, would actually be very beneficial. Uh, second would be about the use of resources at home. So literacy, of course, is a very important thing. And, you know, books and, and, other, I, and other resources is fine. Sometimes research shows that these resources are not used enough as much as they should. And I would also recommend mixing it up a little bit. So you've got, you know, focus on multimodal content in, in different mm -hmm. languages, but in, in, in different ways. So uh, depending on the child's age, it could be video games, it could be TV shows, it could be books, it could be other, you know, songs, but like, but mix it up. Uh, connect it to different domains and experiences for the child. I think that's also really not that done uh, that frequently in all families that are multilingual. I think generally it is, you know, just one or two languages. And then of course you might have a bilingual book here or there, but it is not done as comprehensively or systematically as it might, as it could be. So if you really want them to connect to all their languages, make it interesting for them. And in terms of emotional, you know, experiences, try to tie it to more experiences than just books or one thing or the other, or just you talking to them or, you know, your, your partner talking to them. So like bring in more introduce languages in different domains as much as you as much as you can with them it might not be you know possible but something that you, you know families can look at uh number three is in not, not so much in terms of language learning and all but do try to develop an appreciation in your children about being multilingual i'm not sure how many mm. parents actually have a conversation with their children or mm -hmm. even with themselves about like like who they like what what they are like who they are but 
you know, start talking with kids about what it means to be multilingual. Uh, introduce that perhaps concept if, because and and help them develop an appreciation for it because a lot of children might be learning a lot of languages but they might not really know well why are we doing this what's the point really i mean the parents might have a certain plan for them but they don't really rarely explain it to kids or they might be like oh you'll get a better job i mean if a kid kid's like six seven years old they don't really care about finding a job right now right like it's something that's okay. like, so it's, it's really not a priority for them so Make sure that you are connecting it to relevant domains in their life, that things that they find interesting, age-appropriate domains, but also start talking to them about what it means to be multilingual uh, so that if they do encounter outside, you know, they might find people who are just using one language or monolinguals that they do not feel the need to fit in or they at least understand who they are and why they should be proud about that. Um, and, you know, and perhaps see that in other people as well. So I think there needs to be a more... Fo- a greater focus not just on language learning but also on what that actually means for the child in terms of identity Mm -hmm. right um and yeah maybe i'll just like stick with four right now or uh (laughs) four tips that's great i always say never more than five because we have five fingers we can keep them in mind (laughs) it's easier for everyone to thank you very much for for uh, sharing these tips with us i think they're very spot on and especially the, the, the thing of raising the awareness that multilingual is yeah. something. And it's not, um, like you mentioned several times, and also with Tetsu, we talked about it several times, when we focus mm-hmm. on our languages that we are transmitting, we, we are likely these monolingual kind of mindsets, but in the end, we want them to, to actually use also the other ones. So we are constantly in the back and forth between monolingual and multilingual, appreciate multilingual, although maybe the child is not able to to uh, express him or herself in one language in certain sit- settings because of certain situations. But uh, in the end, that is what we want to raise and what we, we all are who are in screen today. So thank you very much, uh, Raiz, for taking the time to talk about this very important topic today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for, for your words of wisdom. Uh, I, I, I'm totally on the way, same wavelength. I guess, in, in terms of thinking, uh, raising awareness to the kids. Uh, I think it's it's very important. It's not just learning the languages. It's actually like knowing what you've got, <laughs> all these uh, this, this, these assets. Um, well, assets is not maybe not a, not a good word, but letting them really understand what, what it means to be, be multilingual and, and, and live that multilingual experience more actively uh, as they grow up. So... Definitely. Words of wisdom. Thank you so much uh, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to share with us. Uh, shout out to everybody who has been watching us uh, on Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, uh, live. So thank you so much. Uh, we will be seeing everybody again in a month. So uh, once again, uh, on the, the Tuesday, the third Tuesday of every month, we do this uh, little interview with uh with experts in the field of raising multilingual children. So thanks, everybody. Uh, We will see you again next time. Thank you very much. Tot de volgende keer. Adieu, tot de volgende keer.